Hello, Bio 104 students. Uh, in lecture three, we're going to start talking about special topics in evolutionary biology, and we're going to be looking at topics related to sexual reproduction. We're going to be looking at the evolution of sexual and asexual reproduction. We're going to examine the consequent or the concept and uh, examples of sexual selection. And then we'll round off the lecture looking at inclusive fitness in kin selection. Okay, so sex with meiosis evolves in eukaryotes. And a couple of terms that we should familiarize ourselves with is isogamy, where gametes are all identical in size, and this is thought to be the ancestral trait for eukaryotes. And the Derived uh, trait is anisogamy, where gametes um, have different sizes between the sexes, between males and females. And this has evolved multiple times in eukaryotes. So we see the typical animal uh, male uh, gamete, where we basically have the production of four uh, sex cells after the first division after meiosis and a secondary division after meiosis. However, with anisogamy, what we find is in the case of uh, female mammals that you essentially have a single uh, division with meiosis and then a second division of, of the, the sex cell where we, for the production of four sperm cells, we only have the production of a single female gamete. And this female gamete is much larger uh, than the male gametes. So in this case, the female gamete is limiting because you basically get one for four and the female gamete has a much greater uh, material contribution than the male sex cells. So this disparity in size of the sex cells is a derived trait in eukaryotes and it's a trait that has evolved multiple times. Now, most eukaryotes involve a haploid gametes that fuse to form a zygote. That is sexual reproduction. And you remember when we talked about plants and fungi, we were really looking at uh, the stage of the life cycle in the early diverging uh, non-vascular land plants that are haploid versus diploid. Whereas in animal systems, uh, the longest life stage is being diploid, and the only haploid stage are the sex cells themselves. Now, there's uh, sex is a paradox. It's common, but it has some interesting disadvantages leading to the question as to why isn't asexual reproduction more common. First of all, it's the cost of making males. And what I mean about this is that essentially you can't have reproduction without females. Not only is there the disparity in the number of sex cells generated relative to females, with starting with a, a single uh, diploid cell undergoing meiosis and secondary uh, division, uh, but there is the issue of you can't have reproduction without females. So females are the limiting factor here. Then also there's the cost of passing only half of uh, one's genes into the next generation, where with asexual reproduction, the related, the, you're passing all of your genes on to the next generation. Then there are other costs as well. It takes time and energy to switch between uh, mitosis and meiosis, and time and energy to find a willing mate. And then there's the risk of predate, predation uh, in uh, sexual reproduction, as well as the potential of contracting sexually transmitted diseases. So the bottom line here is that asexual reproduction should spread quickly in a population of sexuals, given this high cost of sexual reproduction. So why do we not see this widespread asexual reproduction? Well, it comes down to that with sexual reproduction, you're, we're producing fewer descendants, but much more genetic variation. So here, let's look at basically asexual reproduction. We have the, the uh, parental uh, genotype here, 
and we go through two generations of sexual reproduction and basically we have the same parental genotype. It's essentially fixed. Whereas with sexual reproduction, we're producing fewer offspring, but we're generating many more genotypes relative to the ancestral or parental genotypes. Now, also, sexual reproduction allows potentially favorable genotypes or allelic combinations uh, to come together more rapidly. So in this scenario, what we're looking at are the frequency of different genotypes through time. So if we look at the asexual scenario, and let's say big A, big B is the, uh, would be the genotype that would be advantageous. Well, the way we get to that genotype through asexual reproduction is we need a mutation to big B and then big A. So even if we have a mutation of big B here stuck with little a, there's no recombination. So this will be a dead end. The same here, we'll have a mutation uh, from big A, right? Little a to big A, but then we need to wait for a mutation from little b to big B. Whereas with sexual reproduction, if we have these mutations in the population through recombination, we will have the combination of big A, big B. And you can see that in time, so this say being the present, this being at some point in the past, with sexual reproduction, we're getting to that favorable genotype much more quickly than we would just with mutations happening in asexual reproduction. Now, another disadvantage of sexual reproduction is that recombination can disrupt favorable genotypes, okay? So look at here. So what we have are genotypes that are at a frequency. And let's say this has to do with height of the individual. And what we see is that basically that we have a disruptive selection scenario here where the, the modal um, uh, genotype is actually selected against. So after selection, what we find is that in this case, the heterozygote is at a disadvantage. So the homozygous uh, genotypes have uh, greater fitness. And with asexual reproduction, we would be uh, maintaining this genotype uh, frequency, genotypic combinations. Whereas with sexual reproduction, we're con consistently re coming, recombining these uh, genotypes to where we are then, in a sense, disrupting uh, the favorable genotypes. So why does sex evolve given uh, not just uh, you know, the, the rapidity of which favorable genotypes can evolve relative to asexual reproduction? So why is sex favored? And probably you know, one of the critical theories of evolutionary biology is called the Red Queen hypothesis. And the Red Queen hypothesis is uh, taken from through the looking glass the idea that the Red Queen in Alice Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland, is typically running to stay in the same place. So the idea is that sex is maintained to resist constantly evolving uh, parasites and pathogens. So the idea, let's say we have a trematode parasite that infects a snail host. The parasites are evolving uh, they're, they're evolving uh, the ability to infect the most common snail uh, genotypes in this snail population. And sex allows the offspring to have genotypes that are basically moving away from the most common and providing genetic combinations together that would uh, be resistant to the parasites. And there's some evidence for uh, the Red Queen uh, model in uh, promoting sexual reproduction. So there's a facultative asexual snail species in freshwater habitats in New Zealand that when infected by trematode parasites, they reproduce uh, sexually more often, meaning that they're making more males. So here is uh, the distribution of the populations that were studied of this freshwater snail. And in the population were 
looking at the presence of sexual reproduction based on the frequency of males in the population, right? So the asexual populations are entirely female. When there's sexual reproduction going on, the populations are producing males. And what we see is that there's a correlation between the total infection, that is the, the magnitude of infection of individuals by the trematode parasite and the frequency of males in the populations. So the populations with more parasites are having more sex, more sexual reproduction. Now, the dynamic of the Red Queen shows that if we look at the blue line here being the frequency of one host genotype, and the red line is the frequency of the parasite genotype that can infect it. And what we see just as we talked about when we looked at ecology with predator-prey uh, 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 dynamics, both genotypes oscillate over time as if they are running in circles. So evolutionary change is required to stay in the same place. Cessation of this evolutionary change can result in extinction. Now, because sex is costly, some species have mechanism to ensure that sex only occurs when it's least costly and most uh, beneficial. So for example, in resource-rich environments, yeast uh, reproduce asexually by budding fission. So yeast are uh, fungi, so they're, they're eukaryotes, unicellular eukaryotes. And however, in resource poor environments, yeast switch to rich sexual reproduction, producing haploid spores that fuse to generate genetically diverse offspring. In, in animals, in metazoans, in there, are, there are rotifers that uh, in low density populations are asexual. Then in crowded environments, these rotifers will release a chemical cue that uh, initiates and signals the start uh, for sexual reproduction. So the idea is that the sex may generate genotypes that are less successful than asexual reproduction in the short term. However, sexual populations may do better at times during environmental change. So when conditions are favorable, going back to the Red Queen, when conditions are favorable, we don't need to upset the genotypic frequency. So asexual reproduction is favored. However, when environmental conditions are shifting and changing, the idea is that you want a greater, comp, uh, uh, greater variation among uh, genotypes, so then sexual reproduction is favored. So uh, aphids, uh, many aphids reproduce asexually when conditions are favorable during warm weather months, such as in the summer, but switch to sexual reproductions when conditions deteriorate in the fall. So here's the life cycle in the summer. Basically, we have uh, females that are parthenogenic. That is, females are reproducing without uh, gametes coming from males. However, during the fall, females uh, will then... Uh, Produce, they will be sexually reproductive. They will then reproduce with a male and producing a fertilized egg and then a hatchling, and then that life cycle is then repeated. Now, in some species, asexual reproduction is regularly or normally uh, asexual, and uh, this is not common in, it, in animals, especially not in vertebrates but there are some notable exceptions among vertebrates. So for example, this whiptail lizard, Nemedophorus, which is found in North America, extends all the way from uh, the Midwestern part of the United States all the way down into Mexico, that there are several all-female lineages of Nemedophorus lizards. And in fact, some of these lizards will actually replicate the co active copulation to initiate um, the development of their eggs, even though there is no uh, male gamete contribution to the genotypes of those individuals. Now, often in vertebrates, when we find a all-female uh, asexual reproducing lineages, often this is the result of a hybridization event between two different species that have 
resulted in an immediately reproductively isolated lineage that reproduces asexually. So there are examples in lizards and there are examples in uh, some groups of salamanders. Now, asexual reproduction can happen via seeds through apomixis, and this is actually quite common in some groups of plants. For examples, uh, groups of plants that include raspberry and dandelion. Okay, now one system that has been extensively studied for asexual reproduction in animals is this group called deloid rotifers, a subclade of rotifers. Now, some rotifers are facultatively asexually reproducing, meaning they can be sexually reproducing or asexually reproducing. So deloid rotifers with about 450 species or so seem to, uh, they appear to have been asexually reproducing for about 30 million years. That's about the age of the clade. Now, male deloid rotifers have never been observed. Sexual reproduction in deloid rotifers has never been observed. So deloids also have this really neat uh, physiological trick where they can avoid parasites by essentially desiccating, losing all of their water, and then these desiccated bodies just being blowing away in the wind, being wind dispersed and landing on some aquatic or marine habitat where they can then um, reanimate. So while they're constantly asexually reproducing, their trick in terms of getting around the Red Queen uh, phenomenon is basically just to dry up and blow away. Now, whenever the cost outweighs the benefits in the short run, asexual reproduction may be favored. But there's also this problem of thinking about survival in the long run. And the idea is that maybe asexual species originate and they're successful for a while, but they're highly prone to extinction when environments change. And this also jives with the phylogenetic observation showing you here is a cartoon abstract phylogeny that asexual lineages tend to be young on the, the, the uh, eukaryotic tree of life. So if we're talking about plants or animals, the asexual species are thought to be more prone to extinction. Hence, there are no deep branches in the phylogenies that subtend whole clades of asexual lineages. So most asexual lineages are relatively young compared to all of the other lineages. Giving uh, uh, support for this idea that while there may be an advent, it might be advantageous to reproduce asexually in the short term, in the long term, these lineages indeed are more prone to extinction. Okay. So let's talk about sexual selection. And sexual selection, at least from my perspective, is aimed at asking how in the hell could a trait such as the tail of a male peacock evolve, okay? And this is not through artificial selection that we talked about in terms of humans um, affecting uh, you know, the phenotype of plants and animals, but how do traits like this evolve? Now, we see differences among sexes. It's very common. This is called sexual dimorphism. We have color differences. In all cases here, the male is more brightly colored than the female. We find sexual dimorphism in size, where often males are larger, but not always. So in the cases on the bottom, it's the males that are larger. But in the cases on top here, it is the females that are larger. And uh, other aspects of sexual dimorphism is the common presence of weaponry in animals. And typically, but not always, but typically the weapons are on the male individuals of the species. Now, Darwin um, had essentially, the idea of sexual selection originates with Darwin. And Darwin, in The Origin of Species, starts talking about a struggle between males for possession of females. And the result is, is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. So Darwin was talking about this competition between males for access to females for reproduction. 
Now, the idea of sexual selection was greatly expanded in his book that came out in 1871, essentially his follow-up to The Origin of Species, entitled The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And here he says, the males have basically traits to drive away or kill their rivals, the females remaining passive, while in the other, the struggle is between individuals of the same sex in order to excite or charm those of the opposite sex. Here he's saying generally females, which no longer remain passive, but select the more agreeable partners. So Darwin is distinguishing essentially two aspects of sexual selection. One, competition between males, and the other, uh, where females are choosing males, okay? So we could think about sexual selection as the differential reproductive success caused by competition for mates. And it's usually a struggle among males for access to females. And we could think about it, but not always. Not always a struggle of males for access to females. So we could think about intrasexual uh, selection, where these are males competing with each other, male-male combat or sperm competition. And female choice, which is intersexual, meaning between uh, the sexes, where choosing mates or even sperm choice. Now, the idea of sexual selection, particular female choice, is, um, is based in a large part on Batesman's principle. And the idea is that males are limited by how many fe females they mate with. Females are limited by their own fecundity, that is, their ability to reproduce and care for their young. So if we look at the total of reproductive success versus the number of mates, there is a continuing uh, uh, linear relationship for males, meaning reproductive success is determined by the number of mates. Whereas females, this hits an asthmatope where at some point, the number of mates is not contributing to the total reproductive success. Now, the sex benefits uh, increased mating differ in some species. Sometimes males and not the females care for the young. And so with these reversed uh, uh, sex roles, what we see indeed is that uh, often in the case of these, uh, these water birds here, it's the females that are more brightly colored. In some birds where females are providing the parental care and are more brightly colored, they also have weaponry. Uh, and then of course, seahorses and pipefishes where males have a pouch and brood the young. And in seahorses and pipefish, females are competing for males and prefer larger males uh, because they have larger pouches. So if this role is reversed in Bateman's principle with regard to which sex it is that's limited in its total reproductive success, then the aspects of dimorphism are often reversed. So elaborate weaponry is widespread among mammal, among animals. And uh, basically these weaponry and exaggerated male traits may arise because they increase male mating success. And the advantage should be really large to compensate for the negative effects of survival or fecundity. And so the idea here is you have, let's say a male frog that's calling to attract mates, but that male frog calling to attract mates may also be attracting predators. So there's this trade-off between sexual selection of these elaborate showy, in this case, loud traits versus the natural selection of making oneself vulnerable, in this case, to predation because of the traits. So the question is, do male display traits really decrease survival? Well, uh, they do. So contest competition is where uh, individuals, in this, these cases, males are directly competing for uh, access to mates. So with red deer in Europe, 23% of mature males are injured in fights. 6% of these injuries are permanent. 
And some males get 10 times the mean number of matings. So there are the real winners in the males getting access to uh, mates and individuals are severely injured as a result of these competition uh, contests. Now, sperm competition is competition between the gametes of two or more males to fertilize the eggs of a single female. And this actually happens in plants too, where you could have multiple pollen landing on the stigma, or the female reproductive part, the top of the female reproductive part of a, of a flower. Okay, so let's talk about intersexual selection. That is female choice and the origin of elaborate male traits. So the question becomes, how elaborate can these traits become? Now, the idea is that there, there's females' choice for elaborate traits is, is coded in the genome that there's a genetic basis to the phenotype of this female behavior. And fe uh, field manipulation experiments have shown females prefer an, an exaggerated male or ornament. So this is an African widow bird. And through experimental manipulation where they can make tails that are much longer than that naturally occur in this males of this species, they've shown Research has shown that females prefer the experimentally manipulated, uh, exaggerated tra tail trait. So let's look at this uh, scenario down here. So let's say that tail length is increasing through time. So we're looking at evolutionary time here, that there's a survival advantage to having a small or maybe a moderately sized tail. However, on the range of the variation of tails we're finding in males, there may be then a genotype for female preference arises for the longer part of that uh, distribution of tails. So females start <clears throat> preferring the elaborate trait. So the trait gets long, uh, is exaggerated. So the male tail becomes exaggerated because there's the survival advantage of having some type of tail for aerodynamics of flight, but also the tail length is increasing through evolutionary time because of female choice on that trait. Then what is determined is what is then that optimal length of tail where it's the trade-off between the survival, the ability to fly, and the ability to attract those female mates. And however, if unchecked, the idea is that the female choice would continue choosing a more and more, or in this case, a longer and longer tail, just as exemplified through the experimental manipulation of the uh, natural phenotype of the tail. So at some point, the female choice is going to compromise the ability, uh, the survivability of the individual given that trait. So the trade-off is the point where you have the fitness, we're looking at fitness here and the length of the tail, where the trade-off between having a tail that's so long where you have very low fitness because you have a very long tail and it's very hard to fly and escape predators versus a tail length that is the total of the male fitness of survival as well as mating. That is the probability of giving your genes uh, onto the uh, next generation. Okay, so I'm going to talk about four areas. These are not mutually exclusive, and this is not an exhaustive list. And if you were to take this course uh, with Professor uh, Richard Prum in EEB, who teaches a really uh, wonderful course on ornithology, the biodiversity of birds here at Yale, you'll get a slightly different take on this. This area is, is Professor Prum's specialty, and he's been contributing really interesting and novel theory to this field. 
But for the purposes of Bio 104 here, we're gonna talk about four aspects of female choice. Remember, these are not mutually exclusive and this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, so the first is the good father hypothesis. The idea is that females are picking males that will invest more into mating. They're gonna maximize the acquisition of resource. They are going to help provide parental care, for example. A second uh, aspect of female choice may be the sexy son hypothesis. And this is the idea that females are choosing the best looking males for the sake of their looks alone, so that their own sons will be attractive as mates, all right? So if a female can produce sexy sons, then she's increasing her fitness because then her sons are going to uh, have a high fitness. Then there's the good genes hypothesis, is that females are evaluating the health of the male individual by the ability to have and maintain a healthy looking exaggerated trait. So the exaggerated traits are a way for females to assess the genetic quality of the males. And there's a sensory bias hypothesis is that females are choosing male traits because their sensory systems bias their probability of mating towards males with certain traits in that there's a pre-existing female bias that could be exploited by the males. Maybe that pre-existing bias is a really long tail, that there's just this existing bias and males are going to exploit that bias by evolving longer and longer tails. Okay, so let's look at support for the good father hypothesis. The idea that females are choosing males that invest more. So in many insects, uh, the male presents a nuptial gift before mating. That's often a nutrient rich item that females can ingest and use those resources to produce eggs. And females actually uh, evaluate these gifts. So here's a Katie did female and she's eating the spermatophore. That is the uh, packet uh, that contains the gametes of the male but also other nutritional rich uh, resources that the female then ingest uh, after mating. We have balloon flies that have a spermatophore-like nuptial gift that females eat. And scorpion flies actually present uh, dead uh, prey items to the females uh, as they're uh, reproducing. Sometimes the male uh, himself becomes the nuptial gift. This is sexual cannibalism, where female praying mantises devour the males uh, during mating, as well as sac self-sacrificing males present in many spider lineages, where uh, the male mates with the female and then uh, essentially provides himself as a meal for the female, the idea that uh, the resources, his resources of his body will provide a nutritional supplement for the female to produce uh, healthy and fertilized eggs. Now, support for the sexy son hypothesis, uh, the idea that females are choosing attractive mates so that their sons will be better mates. So this is a study looking at a group of insect sand flies, the effect of father's attractiveness on the reproductive success. They're looking at the mating success of sons and looking at the attractiveness of fathers. So the offspring of females who are choosing highly attractive fathers, their sons have a high mean mating success relative to these other categories of attractives, attractiveness. So the uh, indirect of, uh, benefit to females, the sons of attractive males, have these higher reproductive success rates. Okay, so from the first part of this lecture, you should be able to think about the paradox of sexual reproduction. What are the arguments regarding uh, the cost and benefits of sexual and asexual reproduction? Think about what is sexual selection, male-male competition versus female choice, 
and what are some uh, experiments that have been done and what are the main hypotheses on female choice? Okay, so the second part of the lecture on special topics, we're gonna take a, a few moments to look at inclusive fitness and kin selection. That is altruism and the evolution of animal societies. And the question becomes, why and how does cooperation among individuals evolve? And what about altruism? What do we mean about altruism in terms of biology? So cooperation comes in many different forms. And we see this uh, obviously that animals that live in groups can be less prone to predation because of the vigilance effect of an individual noticing a threat then having a flight reaction that is then uh, alerts all of the other individuals in its uh, community or population around it. So the idea is that basically the number of pigeons in a flock leads to a decrease in the strike of a hawk. And here we have uh, ground squirrels that giving an alarm call, alerting other individuals of a predatory threat. Now, the extreme challenge about cooperation comes in the idea of the evolution of use sociality. And use sociality has three characteristics, is that there's an overlap in generations between parents and their offspring. Excuse me, offspring help parents raise siblings. There's cooperative brood care, and there's specialized casts of non-reproductive individuals. So how would a system like this evolve where we have in a honeybee colony, a single queen and about 500,000 female workers? Individuals are entirely sacrificing their own fitness. Whereas for example, the worker honeybee, if it stings uh, another organism that's a threat to the colony, it actually dies. Because as the stinger stays into the attended target, it pulls out the venom sac, which essentially rips apart the abdomen of the individual. So these individuals are dying in defending uh, the colony. They're invariably going to die if they sting something. So how does this extreme altruism evolve? Now, this is a really, really interesting set of questions. And um, the, the preview is that there's no really clear direct answer. However, there are some tantalizing clues. And uh, what we're gonna learn is that youth sociality has to do with the unique reproductive systems of insects that are youth social, but not all youth social organisms have this unique uh, uh, mode of sexual reproduction. And also what it seems is that there can be advantageous, the ecology in a sense can determine uh, whether or not uh, use sociality is an advantage. Okay, so it's evolved multiple times in insects, use sociality, and it's much more rare in other groups of animals. So in insects, many hymenoptera, hymenoptera is the group that contains the ants, bees, and wasps, also in all 2200 species of termites, we see it in some aphids and some thrips and in some beetles. So a wide range of diversity of in major groups of insects, but it's uh, many of the hymenoptera. And this is, these are kind of the iconic eusocial organisms. Now outside of insects, there's some marine crustaceans, uh, two mammal species, including the naked mole rat, and uh, some cellular slime molds, okay? All right, so Darwin thought about altruism and even hinted at the solution. Uh, he basically said that the evolution of sterile casts of social insects represented a special difficulty which appeared insuperable and actually fatal to his whole theory. However, he thought that it, the threat of use sociality to his theory, that is uh, natural selection with variation in reproductive success and fitness, that, that selection may be applied to the family, as he called it, 
as well as the individual and thus may gain a desired end. So the idea is that there can be a selection that extends outside of the individual. Now, this led to the idea of kin selection uh, developed uh, primarily, uh, well, especially by W.D. Hamilton. And kin selection results in this really interesting concept known as inclusive fitness. So inclusive fitness combines the number of offspring produced by an individual, that is the direct fitness, with the number an individual can produce by supporting others, such as siblings or other, or other family members, is your indirect fitness. So one's in, an individual's inclusive fitness is their own reproductive success plus the reproductive success of related individuals, okay? Inclusive fitness is one's own individual reproductive success plus the reproductive success of related individuals. Now, there's kid selection is thought to be natural, is natural selection based on inclusive fitness, and there's good evidence for this. So kin selection predicts individuals will dispense benefits more often to kin than to non-kin. Certain behaviors will be more common among close relatives, such as altruism and competition and, and cooperation. And selfish and aggressive behavior will be less common among close relatives. And here is a uh, famous example looking at white-fronted fronted bee eaters, they're colonial birds, help their parents during the first two years of life rather than breeding themselves. The more related these individuals are to the offspring, the more the helpers gain and the more likely they are to help. So gain from helping in offspring equivalents, you could see that there's a greater gain based on the coefficient of relatedness, that is how related they are. The probability that an individual helps also is explained by the coefficient of relatedness, that is how related the individuals are to each other, all right? So from Hamilton's perspective, altruism can involve when it increases the fitness of enough relatives to make up for the cost to the altruist. And this is Hamilton's rule. Selection will favor the trait if basically the coefficient of relatedness times the benefit to the recipient minus the cost of the actor is greater than zero. So if the cost of being altruistic is less than the, um, the product of the relatedness of the recipient and the benefit of the recipient, then altruism should evolve. So this has to be greater than the cost, okay? That is the coefficient of relatedness and uh, times the benefit to the recipient has to be greater than the cost of the altruistic behavior. So the coefficient of relatedness is the probability that two related individuals haven't inherited a particular allele at a single locus from their common ancestor. And the coefficient is calculated as R, the coefficient of relatedness, is one half to the nth power, where n is the number of steps separating the individuals in a genealogy, okay? So with basically uh, uh, parents, uh, the relatedness is one half because it's one step, all right? And the same with siblings, it's one half because you're separated by one step. But here I made this, uh, we have this handy diagram that shows your coefficient of individual's coefficient relatedness uh, with relatives. So an individual is, has 100% genotypic similarity with itself. And of course, an identical twin, individuals have 100% genetic, the coefficient relatedness is one. Parents and full siblings or your children, the coefficient of relatedness is 0.5. A full niece or nephew, aunt or uncle, grandparent or grandchild, the relatedness is 0.25, the coefficient. Then a great grandchild, a great aunt or uncle, a great grandparent or a full cousin, the coefficient of relatedness is 0.125. So remember JBS Haldane who quipped about uh, 
the benevolent creator's in non, inordinate fondness of beetles? Well, he had another great uh, quip about the coefficient of relatedness and altruistic behavior. Supposedly stated in a pub in England in 1955, is quoted by a very famous evolutionary theoretician, John Maynard Smith. J.B.S. Haldane has supposedly said, I would lay down my life for two brothers, four nephews, or eight cousins. And the idea is that the number of individuals of which he would sacrifice himself <laughs> is related to the coefficient of relatedness. Now, uh, I hope no one takes this as an off-color joke, but the idea here, it goes right back to Hamilton's rule that the idea of the, the cost of the altruistic behavior must be less than the benefit in uh, the coefficient of relatedness to the individual. All right, now let's look at eusociality again. It's evolved multiple times in insects, uh, particularly in the Hymenoptera. And so what we're looking at here is a phylogeny of the Hymenoptera. And the red lineages are those that are eusocial and the gray lineages are not eusocial. So you could see that we have multiple evolutions of eusociality, potentially some losses as well, but clearly multiple origins. Now, in some Hymenoptera, this is the unusual sexual reproductive system that I alluded to. Males are produced from unfertilized eggs. Let me say that again. If the diploid female lays an unfertilized egg, that is a male. And males are haploid. So this interesting system is haplodiploidy. All right? So if females lay an unfertilized egg, it develops to a male, and that male is haploid. If a female lays a fertilized egg, that is fertilized uh, with a sexual reproduction with a male, a haploid male, then you have a diploid female, right? Okay. So Hamilton suggested that the haplodiploidy predisposed Hymenoptera towards the evolution of eusociality because of its effect on the coefficient of relatedness. So check this out. Mother to offspring relatedness is one half. However, the relatedness of sister to sister is three quarters. And this shows the math here. Probability of sharing an identical parental chromosome times half the genome from the father plus half the probability of identical chromosome times half the genome of the mother, 0.75. Therefore, female workers can spread more of their genes by raising sisters than having their own offspring. If they have their own offspring, their coefficient of relatedness to those offspring is one half. However, by raising up their sisters, their relatedness is three quarters. And this shows a diagram of the haploid diploidy over here on the right. Now, this view of you, the origin of eusociality and Hamilton's pointing out of it potentially being driven by the haplodiploidy uh, system in Hymenoptera formed the basis of the famous evolutionary biologist and entomologist, expert on ant biodiversity, E.O. Wilson, spent his entire career at Harvard. And uh, E.O. Wilson was not only an incredible entomologist, but he was a really important theoretician. He developed the island biogeographic theory that we talked about uh, with Robert MacArthur that we talked about in our ecology lecture. And he also uh, synthesized his views in a very controversial book in 1975 called Sociobiology that argued that much of the aggressive behavior that we see much of the behavior we see, including aggressive behavior that we see in animals, including humans, is a product of biology. All right, so it turns out that this wonderful uh, 
relatedness, uh, interesting coefficient relatedness brought about by the unique haploid diploidy of Hymenoptera is uh, problematic in a number of ways that have come to light since Hamilton. Now, one is that the average uh, coefficient relatedness can be less than one third due to multiple matings of queens before founding a colony. So a queen may show up. Uh, insects can actually store sperm from multiple matings. Uh, workers can be more related to their offspring than to their sisters. Many colonies have more than one queen. If two workers have no parent in common, the coefficient relatedness is zero. And many use social species, including termites, naked mole rats, um, don't have haploid diploidy. So haploid diploidy is not the sole answer for the evolution and maintenance of eusociality. So there must be other factors that um, predispose the evolution of eusociality. And eusociality has only evolved in groups that build nests and take care of their larvae. Many, many insects lay an egg and they lay eggs and they leave it and the larvae are kind of off on their own. So those insects that build nests and live and then take care of their larvae, the ecology, the behavioral ecology of that may be really important in determining eusociality. So the idea here we are looking at, at this, um, we're looking at a phylogeny of part of the Hymenoptera. And we could see that nesting behavior evolves multiple times. These are basically the bees and wasps here. And the origin of these nesting behaviors happens well after the evolution of haploid diploidy. So haploid diploidy does not and everything that's haploid diploid does not become eusocial. It seems that ecological factors that are lowering cost to the individuals, such as building nest and raising and tending the larvae, is in part what might be driving eusociality. Okay, so in this part of the lecture, you should be thinking about eusociality and altruism, uh, be able to articulate kin selection, inclusive fitness. Uh, what is Hamilton's rule, and how might or might not haploid diploidy be related to the evolution of eusociality? So until uh, next time, uh, Bio 104 students, be safe and be well.